teacher of mine once said that to read the gospel and then give the sermon is like to tell a great joke, but then spend 10 to 12 minutes giving exposition to that joke. In a way, it makes a lot more sense to give the build-up beforehand and then end with the punchline, end with the gospel. Taking a page from that book, today's sermon is intended to be heard before you read the gospel from the ninth chapter of Luke. Today's sermon is to be a map to the text of the transfiguration as it is remembered by Luke. I love maps. I haven't always, but I do now. See, when I was a kid, I had a horrible sense of direction. This was in no small part thanks to the local Methodist church where my Cub Scout pack met. See, when we got together to learn orientation, we would lay out our maps over those old, heavy, wooden 1980s folding tables that seemed to live in every church's fellowship hall. Those tables were heavy, primarily because of the cast iron legs and cast iron ring around the edge of the table. So, when you took the cheap compasses that we had in Cub Scouts and then used it on those heavy tables, north would always change because the magnet in the compass would be attracted to whichever edge of the table it was closest to because of the iron ring. You couple this up with a childhood spent traveling between Fremont, North Carolina and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with my father, who would hand me a large map and tell me to figure out where we started, where we were headed, and where we were right then. And, well, cartography in all of its forms ended up terrifying me. However, things change. And now, honestly, I keep a U.S. atlas in my car which has come in handy more than a few times. When leading mission trips with kids, now I am the one who will hand a kid a map and ask them to figure out where we started, where we're headed, and where we are now. This is a long-winded way, I suppose, to say that if you know what you're looking at, a map, for example, it's easy to get the information that you are looking for, to see the bigger picture, and to see all of the details in between. Familiarity breeds knowledge, and knowledge breeds awareness. It's all about the details, I find. And it's true that there's an old idiom that goes, the devil is in the details. Though today, on Transfiguration Sunday, what I find in the details is the Old Testament and the New Testament I find the nativity in the details, the resurrection. I find surprises. I find the whole world. I find the gospel in all of the details. But let me take a step back. Are you familiar with the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? It's this fun idea that from any one actor, you can make a connection to Kevin Bacon within six moves or six movies. We could pick somebody like Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood was in Absolute Power with Laura Linney. Laura Linney was in Mystic River with Kevin Bacon. Two moves. And maybe that was too easy, because Clint Eastwood has been in everything and been around for forever, and at this point in time, it feels like the same for Kevin Bacon. How about Jim Parsons, who played Sheldon Cooper on The Big Bang Theory? Jim Parsons was in Garden State with Ian Holm. Ian Holm is in The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio is in Catch Me If You Can with Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks was in Apollo 13 with Kevin Bacon. This game can go on for hours. If you would like to continue, I recommend checking out oracleofbacon.org. That's a real website. Regardless, my friends and I used to play this kind of game a lot on road trips because it was fun to find these connections between people and things that we wouldn't expect. And that joy, the joy of the unexpected, is what I find in today's gospel, which I 
think of as the Kevin Bacon of scriptural passages, something you can get to in a million different ways. The, the ways that I find that we can get to Jesus in the transfiguration are almost limitless. So here's the fun part. Again, I believe that we can get to Jesus in the transfiguration from any part of scripture, like six degrees of transfiguration. So let's see if we can put that to test. The Old Testament to the transfiguration is easy. Moses and Elijah are there on the mountain with Jesus, with Peter, John, and James. Boom. How about more generally, Jesus' teaching? How do we get from any given parable to the transfiguration? Consider this. How do you think Peter, John, and James knew who Moses and Elijah were? I mean, they obviously knew the text, but, and I don't feel that this is a spoiler, there were no photographs or illustrations in the Old Testament that they would have had access to. Therefore, at some point in time before Luke wrote his gospel, Jesus would have had to teach or explain or nod to Peter, John, and James to who these two people were who appeared side by side with him on top of this mountain. And then Luke heard the story after Jesus had taught Peter, John, and James. Once again, here is Peter learning and Jesus teaching, explaining, and letting him know what's happening. Again, maybe these are too general and too easy. So let's consider the church seasons. Let's consider Advent. Peter, John, and James, at the end of our text, are silent and waiting, waiting to see what God will do next in the person of Jesus Christ as they walk down this mountain on a journey that ends at Golgotha. Waiting is the theme of Advent. Or how do we get from Christmas to transfiguration? Well, at Christmas, angels come out of nowhere singing. Here, Moses and Elijah do the same. First, Jesus is in front of Peter, John, and James, like the angel to the shepherds in the field, who is then joined by the multitude of the heavenly host. Here, Peter, John, and James see what is happening to Jesus, and then Moses and Elijah appear out of nowhere. Also, the glory of Christ shines like an angel to these disciples who are standing on the mountain like shepherds in a field. Okay, what about Epiphany? Well, in Epiphany, we have three wise men who then go home. And here, in our text from Luke, we have three men, Peter, John, and James, who know that they cannot stay because they try to, and Jesus moves them along. Lent, the next season of the church year, is literally where Peter, John, and James are headed with Jesus as this gospel reading comes to a close and they are silent and come down the mountain. They are beginning the journey to Jerusalem. They are literally taking the next steps into the Lenten season. How about Good Friday? Good Friday to Transfiguration. Well, on Good Friday, Jesus will be crucified between two criminals. And today, we see the foreshadowing as Jesus is between two people. Also, at Jesus' feet, there are Peter, John, and James, a reflection that later in the Gospel of Luke, we will find at his feet the two women and the centurion, an image reflected or refracted. Following Good Friday comes Easter, and in Easter, the dazzling white cloth that we read about today will be found folded in, in the tomb. Then there's Pentecost, when the voice of God is heard by all those who are gathered through various tongues, which we see reflected here as the disciples hear the literal voice of God. After Pentecost, there's the story of Paul and all that Paul adds to the New Testament. How do we get from Paul to the transfiguration. Well, before Paul was Paul, Paul was Saul. So a pre-Paul Saul, Saul, Jesus, 
And after pre-Paul saw Saul, Jesus, he fell and his eyes were covered in scales. There was a physical change. Just like in the Old Testament, when Moses was speaking to God wearing the veil and he came down the mountain, his face was shining and physically changed. Here in Transfiguration, Jesus' face is shining and changed. An echo of the truth that when you speak to God, it changes who you are. Or what about beyond Paul? How do we get from beyond Paul back to transfiguration? Well, I believe that one of the ways we can do this is with the understanding that the transfiguration happens outside of Bethsaida in the northern kingdom. Before, Jesus and Peter and John and James head to the southern kingdom showing us that not only does God's love for the world, not only does the ministry of church extend through time, the Old Testament and the New Testament, but it also crosses borders and extends beyond our reach because it is the power of God's reach. Now, you might be asking yourself, Pastor Hilly, this is great, or at least it's an entertaining mental exercise. But what am I supposed to take away from all this? Why does it matter? How is this practically applicable in any way? Well, I believe that familiarity breeds knowledge, and knowledge breeds awareness. Awareness of a map allows us to easily decipher where we started, where we are headed, and where we are now. Looking at our gospel for this Sunday, we can see the same. We can see the Old Testament and the New Testament, and today we can see Epiphany and Transfiguration Sunday and the season of Lent ahead of us. Exercising our biblical knowledge gives us a greater view of what Jesus is doing, how God is interacting with the world, and how we are part of the human story that continues to wrestle with the understanding of faith and God's actions. So let us not miss this opportunity to see the different ways that we can get back to Jesus. These are not stories or seasons for the sake of themselves, but paths to get us to Jesus. And in that moment, in that moment of us getting to Jesus is the great aha moment of this whole exercise. It's where the switch happens. Because yes, we can get to Jesus through all of these different ways. But you know what? We don't have to. Because Jesus is already there. Jesus is already with us. Jesus is on your mountaintops with you. Jesus is in your valleys. Jesus is waiting in the waters of your baptism, blessing you at the table which Jesus sets for you. Jesus is with the assembly whenever it is gathered in his holy name. Jesus is waiting for that assembly to gather. Jesus is here with you right now. Jesus is the one connecting us to the church of the first century, to the prophets of the Old Testament, and to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of which we are members. Jesus is connecting us to the kingdom and the power and the glory that is God Almighty forever and ever. Jesus is the one doing it all. Jesus is the one who holds the whole world together in his hands. Thanks be to God. Amen.